Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's Consumers Health Forum webinar on the My Health Record. Today we're focusing on the issue of privacy and security of the MHR record in the first of our series of six webinars on the My Health Record, which I'll refer to now as MHR. My name is Mark Metherill, and I'm the Communications Director of Consumers Health Forum and I'll be facilitating today. We're very fortunate to have uh, five people with us who will be able to respond to the issues raised today. Uh, these are people well informed and expert in the various different aspects affected by MHR. I'd like to introduce them. First, we have Dr Kim Webber, who's the General Manager Strategy at the Australian Digital Health Agency which is administering the MHR. We have Dr Charlotte Hesby, who's a Sydney general practice uh, practitioner uh, and also heads the general practice and primary care uh, research at Notre Dame University. I have Karen Carey, who's a former chair of the Consumers Health Forum and has been a consumer rep with on advisory councils with the National Health and Medical Research Council and also Dr Bruce Bear Arnold who's assistant professor at the law school at Canberra University and is an author and analyst on data and privacy. So thank you all for joining us. I think we're very fortunate to have uh, this group of people with such uh, informed knowledge. And of course we thank you, the attendee participants, for participating today and for sending in the questions which do help uh, inform us as to the issues people are thinking about out there. So it's a, it's a very valuable uh, thing that we have. The webinars have been designed and directed by the Consumers Health Forum and we also receive funding support from the Austra Australian Digital Health Agency. Well, as we've seen in the past week, uh, secure, secrecy and sorry, security and privacy of the MHR has been something of a, a leading issue, and we w wanted to take this uh, as an a, a opportunity today to look at it more carefully. Uh, the federal government has taken measures to enshrine in legislation safeguards when it comes to uh, confidentiality of medical information uh, in an announcement they made last week. We at the Consumers Health Forum have strongly supported uh, a national electronic uh, health record system for some years because we believe it'll do much to improve the effectiveness, safety and access to the health information for the benefit of both patients and clinicians. Um, so these latest measures uh, that the government has introduced are in response to concerns about security and privacy safeguards. Now the legislation that they've announced will enshrine uh, in law uh, to ensure that no health record can be released to police or government agencies for any purpose without a court order. As well, the new measures will also enable individuals to order permanent deletion of their health record from the system. So many of the topics we'll talk to today reflect the thrust of the questions and issues you've raised in your messages to us. And I'd like to start first with uh, Kim uh, to respond to some sort of fairly basic questions about MHR which have been raised in recent times. So first of all, Kim, what information is an MHR, is in an MHR and what is the timetable for any further development of that information on the MHR? Um, and I'm sure my colleagues on the panel could also talk about this because particularly Charlotte uses it um, already in, in clinical practice. But at the moment um, we've had the My Health Record system operating um, for about six years and there are a range of um, documents and information that are in 
um, a My Health record, ranging from um, some of your billing information through the Medi um, through Medicare and through um, pharmaceuticals that you might have um, had prescribed to you. Um, uh, event summaries from when you've been to visit a clinician or a hospital, you might have discharge summaries. So some of that information that would have normally gone from um, your uh, hospital back to your GP will, can also be in the My Health record. And then also some other um, documents like an advanced care directive, which is actually something that a consumer can um, put into their My Health record to communicate to clinicians about how they want to be treated um, uh, kind of as part of end-of-life care. Um, it also has um, pathology and diagnostic imaging results and um, uh, reports. So a range of information from pharmacies, from general practices and from hospitals which comes together um, for someone's My Health record. And of course, when, um, when a, a My Health record is created, that is the start of that process. So there's no um, kind of... Uh, uh, I guess, um, place where those documents are stored at the moment. So when you create a, a My Health record, the first thing that goes in there is um, if you, if you um, set your uh, controls to that is MBS and PBS information. And it's really from then on that information starts to flow into your record. So I've had a record since 2013 and it has my, um, my medical visits, some information about um, a surgery on my wrist and um, the medications that I'm on. And I also have a shared health summary, which is, um, a, I guess, a, my health history and information that was curated by my general practitioner and put in there, which is really a snapshot of my, my health at that time. Kim, can I ask, who will have access to that record? Um, so the people who care for you in your clinical team, um, the clinicians that you would see, um, whether you go to the hospital, whether you go to an allied health provider or a general practitioner, as part of providing you with that, that um, care, those are the people who can access your record. And how will last week's measures announced by the government affect uh, the protections around release of your data? So um, the Australian Digital Health Agency is the system operator for the My Health Record system. And we already had a policy in place that we wouldn't release um, data to um, third parties like law enforcement unless there was a court order in place. And the reason we had that, um, that policy in place is because first and foremost, our role is to make sure that the public and clinicians have confidence and trust in the system so that they will use it to improve their healthcare. So we already had that policy in place. What this um, change in the legislation done is uh, is doing is actually putting that within the legislative framework which, which guides us anyway. So in terms of what, um, what our practice is, it doesn't actually change that, but it does give that confidence and that trust to all Australians that um, it would require a legislation change to ever change that. And for those who don't opt out, the default will mean that the uh, data on their record is in a sense open. Where can people find easy to understand instructions about how to access and control the data? Um, so the My Health Record um, website, which is um, myhealthrecord.gov.au, has a lot of information about how you can set privacy and access controls. And as you say, um, one of those is that you can actually opt out of, of having a record. So that's what this um, period of time is, is is really taking um, a human rights approach, making sure that everybody understands that they can opt out of having a record and how they can do that quickly and easily. You can also, um, once you have a record, you can set a record access code, which is a, a, a four digit um, number that you can put on your record and then um, a clinician needs to have you in the room to ask you that code um, in order to access your record. You can also um, put a code on specific documents within your record. So you might want to um, put in some, a certain set of documents and then put a, a code on those so the rest can be accessed as, as a clinician would when, you, um, when they're treating you. But those specific documents, they need to ask your permission and, and get that code. Um, and uh, also you can um, delete documents from within your My Health record if you want to do that. Um, and restrict their access, as I, um, as I said. So there are a range of those privacy and access controls that, that you can put in place. 
can researchers access MHR data for research purposes? Um, so what you're talking about there is actually um, called secondary use of My Health Record um, data and the, um, the Department of Health uh, last year and, and this year did a broad consultation around secondary use of My Health um, Record data. Um, so a, 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 um, a whole range of um, policies and processes are being put in place by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, which is a, um, a very um, trusted data analytics agency that's been doing um, uh, data analysis for um, many, many years. And so they are going to be the data custodian for this secondary use. Um, it's going to take quite a bit of time to set that up, so no data will be released to them until at least um, 2020. And importantly, only de-identified data is actually going to be, be released from the agency to the Institute of Health and Welfare, so that that won't include any um, inf information that would uh, identify a person um, within within that within that data set, and that will allow the institute to then um, uh, have a rigorous governance and ethical framework, which they're currently putting in place, which um, researchers will be able to then have a look at the data. What about access by insurers and other companies to that de-identified data? Um, so insurers are specifically um, excluded from being able to access any information. Um, for secondary use. And importantly to note, as part of um, the My Health Records um, Act and the act that goes with it, which is the Healthcare Identifiers Act, um, it's already uh, prohibited for um, the My Health Record system and the healthcare identifier system to be used by insurers for setting premiums or anything like that, or employers for any employment purposes. So those things are already prohibited in the Healthcare Identifiers Act and you cannot access the My Health Record system without using a healthcare identifier. So those safeguards are already in place for that. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I'd like to go broader now and ask each of our uh, panellists um, their perspective on what the key issues of privacy and security are that we need to explore when looking at MHR. What do people need to consider about the safeguards and regulatory oversight of MHR data? And I'd like to start with Charlotte. Thank you. Um, I suppose I, I need a little bit more um, direction in terms of, do you mean as a GP? What well, as a GP, what... from, from your perspective, what are the sorts of issues when it comes to privacy and confidentiality that strike you when we're talking about MHR? Look, from my perspective, I don't think there's anything different about my HR from the way in which I think we should be thinking about our whole medical records. So... You know, at the moment, we have sort of a whole lot of um, individual records. If you go to a hospital, you have a health record um, created for you, which has got information there, and the people at that hospital have access to that data, but nobody else, and not you once you've left there. Um, you can ask for certain summaries, and with your permission, they might release information. Um, and the same thing with, uh, with, you know, your GP, who's got a record. If you go to another GP, they've got a record. So at the moment, we've got lots of different places that have your information stored. And so there are issues about the privacy for you and access and those around it, which at the moment is very much about the person who's got the custodial rights of that particular record. The difference for my health record is that it is going to be a sort of a, a repository of the summation of visits. So it doesn't have the richness of the data that is in um, your record. So for me as a GP, I've got really quite, you know, um, complete notes about someone, but the summary that I put can put up onto the My Health record in consultation with my patient, I never put anything up on there without actually making sure that the person who I'm uploading it about is comfortable with the information that goes up. Um, and I think that's an important part of this whole process. That now means that someone else can have a look at that summary document as well as the person who owns it so that it might help in directing care or being safe about it. And for me, that's about what medications you might be on, what things have happened in the past that are important medically that mean that ongoing care is affected by that, 
What allergies do you have? What immunisations have you had? Those are the key things that are in that summary. And those are the things there. And there are really, there are very, you know, it's a one page document. We're not talking, you know, like a health file that most of us think about, you know, can sometimes, if you've got a lot of things happening, can be, you know, files and files. That is not accessible through My Health Record and it's never going to be. Um, the point of the My Health Record is really a conduit of the important facts that need to be able to be accessed between the points. And so the privacy is really important because I don't want that summary accessed by people who shouldn't be able to access it and it needs to be very much with the permissions and the security and I'm certainly confident from my perspective the things, I, the hoops I've had to go through to be able to put up a record have, are really, you know, very, very secure. Um, it's very different from then having someone actually accessing the file that I keep about somebody that's behind the generation of that summary. And I think sometimes we get that gets lost in this conversation, that because we're calling it a health record, people think that it's the health record and it's the, you know, the really rich file that talks about the everything. Um, and remembering too that in that summary conversation, so I'll talk to someone and say, okay, you know, you've, I've been seeing you for the last 20 years and we've had, you know, you've had arthritis, you've got, um, you know, you've had an operation for your gallbladder, you've seen me a few times about anxiety, um, what are the things that we think need to go on to that summary that are important for somebody else? Now, we might say the anxiety doesn't need to go there. Nobody else needs to know about that. Mm. That's being managed and it's not an important thing. But yes, I think it's important that people know your gallbladder's come out. And I think it's important that we know which joints are affected for arthritis in terms of, you know, ongoing care for other issues. And the medicines that you're taking for those um, are really important. So mm. it's, a, it's about understanding what's important, what needs to be there. Um, and then you can go home and go, actually, I don't want that there after all. So you can actually lock that one down exactly as Kim was talking about, or you can come back to me and go, can we do that again and put up a document that actually reflects the things that I want? Because actually I do want the anxiety to go up. Yeah. Um, I've thought about it and I realised that I really do want someone to know that I, I do get anxious about things yeah. And, yeah. and I need you to, to actually be able to have conversations that are mindful of that and respectful of that. Thanks, Charlotte. Karen, if I can ask you, what sort of issues do you think, as a uh, long-time health consumer advocate, we need to be thinking about in terms of privacy and security with MHR? Sure, Mark. Um, I think that generally, overall, people are best taking the attitude that the data may be made public by a mistake, yep. by um, someone criminal activities, yep. by something. Let's just assume that the data might become public. So then for people, for individuals, the issue is to identify their personal risk if that data becomes public, to minimise the risk and to mitigate it. At the moment, the discussion, certainly the, the social media discussion and things, has been about either having a record or not having a record. But there is this really important third option, which is to have a record, but to manage it quite closely so that it only has the information in it that you consider to be appropriate and not put you at risk. Um, that really means that for an individual, each piece of data that's considered to be put on the, to the record, you need to say, what is the risk if this information becomes public, becomes known by my employer, becomes known by my husband or family, all of those things that we've managed to identify that are real risks, um, and then mitigate them. Manage your record tightly, lock them up in the code, ask your doctors to not have them. Um, they're always of ensuring that you get the benefits from having the My Health record without necessarily the risks. So it's about minimising the risks. There's a few things that I think people need to be aware of. Um, we talk about having the MBS and PBS data there as really an accounting record. Um, it may be possible, looking at MBS item numbers, to identify a service that you've had it may be possible looking at the PBS data to identify drugs that you've had for a specific condition. Um, people with mental health conditions are particularly sensitive to having an My Health record. 
um, for very good reasons. We know that people with mental health issues do suffer bias. So um, you need to check whether or not that MBS data and PBS data contains information that might identify the fact that you have a mental health issue, if you are taking a drug for psychosis. Um, those are the things that you need to look at. That's about risk identification and then minimise and mitigate that risk for you as an individual. And I really think that that's the way that people will get the most benefit out of the My Health record. I think it would be a great disappointment for individuals and for Australia generally if people simply opt out because they don't feel they have control. The controls are there, they are reasonable, but we should not um, in any way minimise the risk that that data might get out. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Bruce, what's your sense of it? Well, I think I'm probably the, ba the bad boy on, on this panel. Uh, basically, we've heard what's effectively an, ad an, an advertisement from the people who are going to run the system. We've been told that the policy will protect you. Policies can change within five minutes. We've been told that the legislation will change to give you meaningful protection. At the moment, that's simply a vague promise. And again, legislation can change. Doesn't take, take very much. And what we've seen historically in Australia over the last 30 years in a range of sectors is that we start off with fairly robust protection, at least in, the, at least in terms of law, and over time, that protection is eroded drip by drip, drip by drip, so that ultimately you have very little protection. We, we've heard that sort of, oh, all, all right, there will be accountability, there will be a strong framework. The main regulator in Australia for privacy uh, was on death row for a couple of years. The Attorney General, who really cares about uh, consumers, the Attorney General said, really, we don't need this body. Uh, there was a bit of pushback. We, ha we currently have the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. It's grossly under-resourced. It doesn't have expertise. It doesn't have bodies. And it has a culture that it's a, it's a toothless tiger. Uh, when you can actually get it out of its cage, it tends to lick the hand of the Health Department and the Attorney General's Department and any other department uh, in the Commonwealth Government. We need to be conscious, if we're talking about risk, we need to be conscious about what's happening out there in the real world so if we look at Singapore, a model for Australia, the, the equivalent database, equivalent system in Singapore uh, was hacked only a few weeks ago. We've heard about protection for medical records. What's happened in New South Wales in the last two weeks? Uh, thousands of patient records were basically abandoned by, by the New South Wales government, an agency that we would expect to care for consumers. And if we look at overseas, the My Health Record system is based on a flawed, failed system in the UK, where, among other things, the policy planners quite explicitly planned to sell off bulk health data. Hospital incident, incident records, we heard a moment ago, in the UK, hospital incident records for basically most people in London were sold to insurance companies. Uh, the government made a, an express commitment. It was busy planning to sell bulk health records for the whole of the UK population to drug companies, insurers and basically anyone else who could pay. Why am I saying this? Because ultimately we have to be sensible about risk. We have to be wary about assurances that we're getting, all right, the government cares for you and the government will look after you and we have policies and law uh, and regulators. Those things can all change. We need to look a bit beyond what we're hearing and be, I think, hard-headed and think about what are the implications? Discrimination, perhaps, stigma, care, and ultimately respect for individuals. If the government was so concerned about privacy, why did it have to wait till five minutes to 12? Why are we getting a promise, and simply a promise at this stage, a promise at this stage that you can opt out, that, sorry, a fix that you can opt out, and a promise that in future will, uh, the legislation will be changed so that basically anyone in government can't get access to records simply by asking. Why did we have to wait so, wait so long? This tells us something fundamental about the government's policy, fundamental about how government views consumers. Thanks, Bruce. What about the benefits of the system? We're talking, you've raised those points. Uh, 
about this and it, it does seem as though since the legislation was first promulgated uh, five or six years ago, community sensitivity, knowledge, awareness of data risks, data threats, threat has certainly uh, increased. Yep. But don't you have to put the benefits of such a system of having comprehensive health records for easy access by both the consumer and the clinician? How much is that worth? I think it's it, it's incredibly valuable, both in term both in terms of the national economy, in terms of for the taxpayer, uh, for individual patients, and the people people that we all love. Uh, I have people out there who I love. Uh, I just love some of my my friends and relatives to pieces. As someone who teaches law, who teaches health law in particular, uh, who's worked in the IT sector, I'm really keen on an effective, comprehensive national health system. I'm really keen on a comprehensive, effective national e-health system. But unfortunately, my health record is not it. And simply plastering lipstick on this pig will not make it, make it a good system. We need to think as a community about what we want to do. We need effective regulation. We need effective, effective resourcing. Uh, and we need a meaningful commitment on the part of, part of all the stakeholders, government, ADHA, clinicians, even people like me, to make the system work. At the moment, it is a flawed system uh, and it needs to be fixed. We can't simply rely on sort of tinsel, all right, I'm the minister, don't worry, uh, I will fix it. Because the next minister could well change his mind. Karen, you wanted to say something. Yes, I just think that we should look at this issue of the benefits of the system. I absolutely agree with you. It's about individuals looking at the benefits for them against the risks. Um, what we know about the healthcare system, and we have all worked hard towards for many decades, is that there are some things in the healthcare system that have really let patients down, and we find them readmitted to hospital. Those things are discharge summaries. So we talk about the valley of death of leaving the hospital. Yeah. We don't get a discharge summary and then our GP doesn't know the medication changes that we've had. They don't know the tests that we've had and we get in all sorts of trouble. Um, medication safety, so it's estimated that one of, out of every 10 people in hospital are there because of an adverse incident with their medication. Um, because we don't have a comprehensive medication record. People, when you go out and you speak to patients, quite often they say that in the hospital they instigated a new medication regime when in actual fact it's the same drug they had before but it's a different name. Then my health record should deal with things like that. And then there's the duplication of tests. And this is an issue for patients. It's an issue for the public economically because we waste a lot of money in the healthcare system duplicating tests. But it's also a problem for individual patients. When you are in serious strife, with your health, you need something to happen quickly. Not being able to access your blood test that you've had just three days ago is a real problem. It compromises your health. So those things are all benefits of the system. Um, individuals will all get different types of benefits. There are additional benefits. But what we've looked to the e-health record to solve for us is really those big problems. And as a consumer representative, we've been highly critical of the system for saying, why on earth haven't you solved this problem? I can go to my hairdresser yeah. and they can tell me what I've had done to my hair for eight years. Why can't you tell me what medications I'm on? So I think it's important for people to understand that the development of the e-health record has been very consumer driven because there are these problems in the system that it should solve and it would be great to solve them. The research benefits is another issue um, there is an argument that if the public is paying for services, shouldn't it have access to the data to be able to do research to make sure that the services work? So that's also a big benefit for patients. Um, but it is about every individual assessing their own risk for that data and then either managing that risk or choosing to opt yep. off until they feel the system is more safe. Kim, could you come in here? What do you think about this issue that in the end, as Karen says, it's for the consumer to balance their, their beliefs, their <laughs> needs from the health system to balance the risk? These sorts of more personalised um, mm. decisions, what do you I, think? I think it absolutely is an individual decision and that's really what this opt-out period is about, is, is the public debate has been um, really interesting and is, is absolutely beneficial because this is exactly how we want people to think about their own um, their own health care. So I 
um, personally um, uh, registered for um, a My Health record. It was um, known as the personally controlled electronic health record back in 2013, before I ever worked in digital health. I'd worked in health equity and in rural health policy um, for my whole career, but I, read, I registered myself um, for a record because um, I know about the golden hour, which is, you know, when something happens to you, a stroke or a heart attack, there's this kind of golden hour where um, treatment can be um, provided. And I wanted, um, I'm, I'm currently pretty healthy and I'm not on um, any medications, but I want clinicians in an emergency department to know that. I want them to know that they can immediately give me um, whatever the, the best medication is because I don't have any, um, you know, I, I don't have any medications that are going to clash with that. I want them to have that information um, directly at hand. So that was, you know, my personal reason for actually registering was safeguarding my health for an emergency situation because I don't have a chronic illness, I don't have records that I need to keep track of, but I do want those decisions made in, a, in an instant, um, which will be of most benefit to me. So that was personally um, for me, um, why, I, uh, why I registered for a record. But I think the, the issues around having to take time off work for repeated tests and um, the cost and expense to consumers, I think is, is um, absolutely a benefit. But the medication safety so, um, is, is, is the number one issue. So the fact that so many people are harmed through um, medication misadventure, I think that is a huge area of work for the not only the digital health agency, but the broader health system, consumers, and, and um, in our national digital health strategy, which is our four-year um, plan for the future, medication safety is right at the centre of that. It has a whole pillar of attention to it because it's where we can save the most lives, improve um, and improve healthcare. And if I just add, even um, when my grandparents, I remember when um, towards the end of their life, when they would go into hospital and then their medications would be changed um, it, with the best intentions, but we knew those medications had already been tried and that they didn't react well within my grandparents. You know, now um, I think the treating physicians would have much more information to be able to make decisions about changing medications than they did for when my grandparents were around. And that's, that's why I've become, I've joined Digital Health to be part of that, to be part of the way that we really um, are going to make make that difference, particularly around medication. Charlotte, on a on a related issue, uh, some in the medical profession have been critical of the fact that if patients have a choice of what goes on and off their record, this may in fact uh, endanger uh, you know clinicians' treatment decisions down the track. What's your feeling about this? Oh. Well, I mean, I would agree that if people are withholding really important pieces of information, that that can make a difference to what then gets communicated. The conversations that I have with my patients about what goes on and what doesn't go on is about that safety issue. It's like, well, what things do matter? What is it that needs to be communicated to somebody else that really does affect your, your health care? And I think that goes back to the setting of the risk mitigation and what are the things that um, do or don't um, need to be safely communicated. So we make a choice, and it's an informed choice, um, about understanding the importance of having the medications there so that there is this record of what is being, you know, taken and not taken and so that errors don't happen. Look, I'm excited about the fact that on a daily basis, there are issues that arise because of poor communication between systems about the not knowing um, the name, exactly what Karen was talking about. I have got patients who go and see a specialist. They can't necessarily remember the conversation that happened with the specialist, but they know that they will put on a new medication. They come to me and they go, look, I really don't know that I want to be on it and I don't understand it, but I can't remember the name of it. I haven't got the letter yet from the specialist because some specialists aren't very good at sending letters in a timely manner. And I've already found that my health record has been a really good way of being able to go because you can open it up and see what was actually dispensed by the pharmacy at that time. You go, okay, this is what it is. This is what it's supposed to do. And this is how we can make, you know, these are the choices about whether it's a good option for you or not. 
Same thing with changes in medication, being on the same thing, being able to chase up what did or didn't happen. Um, I've got some elderly patients who went up to the North Coast, um, ended up in hospital, had to have some investigations done, were put on stuff, came back to me and had lost all the documentation somewhere. Couldn't remember what the details were. And so, now normally that can take me several hours of phone calls to try and chase up. What was really nice was I was, with their permission, able to access the My Health record, and on there, there was actually, although there wasn't a discharge summary from the hospital, that would have been really nice, and hopefully down the track, there was some investigation results. And I was able to, through that, safely figure out what had actually happened and figure out where we needed to go, which goes back to the things that go on. It is about, you know, that being able to communicate safely um, things. And I really understand why you might be not wanting certain bits of information to go on. So I have these conversations with my patients, say, with a psychotic um, illness about whether the, the diagnosis goes onto the record or not. And it's like, well, what happens if you get hit by a bus? Um, nothing, you know, a, ma a minor injury. So maybe, you know, we're talking about a little bus and you get knocked over, but you hit your head and you're a bit delirious. You get into hospital and they don't know what you're on, what you're not on, etc. Do you actually want them to know the important medications that you're on? I think you, you should, you know, like those are the times when it's really, really important. And so I get that we need to be really mindful of, of what I know is the prejudice and bias around certain things. But for me as a practitioner, if you're experiencing that, then you probably need to go to another practitioner anyway. Maybe that's a good red flag that it's not the right person. But it should never get in the way of, of uh, me being able to care for you properly and make sure that it's always the best care for that condition at that time. Um, and so I'm a complete advocate for it. I totally get that it's not, it's not the best, it's not what I want yet. But can I tell you, I've worked with it right from the very beginning. I was an early adopter trying to get it to be what I thought was really the best thing for patient care. And it's improved so much over that time. And we can only improve by using it and going, this is not doing this, or there are these gaps, or do you not realise that you need to be able to protect your safety that way? It's an, it's an evolution and, yep, I get you that there might be a risk that happens when something bad happens. So far, we've been really good. There hasn't been, um, you know, any breaches in, in the data and it's been, I think, well managed and there's a really good system in place to try and pick up um, where those happen. So, for instance, if you open up your My Health record, you can actually see who's opened it um, and you can then go back and interrogate, well, that, that person shouldn't have. Um, where, from my understanding, all the other systems around the world, nowhere has got such a good ability for you as the owner of that health record to actually understand who might be accessing it, why, and what the informations are actually accessible. Thank you. Karen, you had a problem. Um, just two things. So on that issue of access, um, some consumers have raised with me, and I don't have the expertise to answer it, but it seems to be a relevant issue. And that is that quite often when you walk around hospitals, you'll notice that their computer terminals are open yeah. because doctors open them up yeah. to work on patients and because of their workflow, it makes sense to leave them open. Yeah. So there is a concern that um, the system is only as secure as all of those terminals are secure. And that's why I think it's important to take a view, for individuals to take a view, that their information may get out in the future. Yeah. Won't, not definitely, and if it did, it might not actually have any effect. So a lot of these thefts of information haven't actually had serious consequences for the people whose information has been released. So I think there's, there's that. I think there's vulnerability in the system. There has to be vulnerability. We can't close off that vulnerability because we'd make the system unworkable yeah. for doctors. Doctors have to be able to link in and, and use their normal workflow in a hospital. Um, but I think that you can manage, you know, and minimise and mitigate yes. that risk. Um, I just also wanted to comment on your point about the medication safety. Um, the example that you were giving of the older couple, mm. that to me is a, a good scenario. Um, I myself have had a heart transplant, so I'm on more than 20 medications. On a good day, I can tell you exactly what they are and exactly what dosage I'm on. 
But on a bad day, when I've lost consciousness yeah. and I've recovered and I'm in hospital, I could not string yeah. two words together. And I think that, you know, the e-health record is a bit of an insurance policy for when things go wrong. So it is valuable for us in our day-to-day -day chronic illness sort of lives, but it's much more valuable at that pointy end, and it's the pointy end that can save your life. Can I say, you got me on, my, that's my big passion. It is about, you know, and things change, and so being able to sort of upload the changes so that, um, that there is an up-to-date record at all times, mm. Um, and that's one of the really nice things about the My Health Record. It, when someone like myself opens it um, with a patient in front of me, they actually, the, the system is able to give me a list of what would appear to be the current, all the current medications. And so well, I actually did a little exercise to see how good it was. And it's actually, from my perspective as a GP, is really keen to make sure that my medication lists are always up to date. The, it actually um, reconciled really well. Um, it was fantastic. Going back to the issue of the access of records in the hospital, though, that's really a different issue in many respects because that's the whole of the hospital record, which is sort of like I was talking about the richness of my record in my mm. GP file, which is quite different from what gets uploaded onto the My Health record. To get into the My Health record is another couple of security steps from the terminal that's open you know, good or bad, and that's really about, again, I think looking after the data that is in our hospital's records and who can access it, which although is completely relevant to the My Health record, yeah. is really another conversation again it's about how we problem. manage those, yes. It's a human problem, and not a, a technology problem, which is one of the reasons that, one of the reasons that uh, regulatory capacity, the ability, you know, meaningful law, meaningful rules, follow up by regulators, is really important, and we do not have that at the moment. And you've, people have, sorry, people have been talking, talking about change, improvements. Yes, the system isn't perfect, but don't worry. Over time, time it will improve. Great op-ed in today's Sydney Morning Herald, and I suspect in the Age from Wendy Benithan, who's a molecular geneticist. Uh, what we see at the moment, again, one minute to twelve. The government, the government's acknowledging that uh, in in claims of future-proofing the system, uh, we're building, a, building an extra capacity. So, we're, you know, we're heading towards, heading towards building a national genomic data repository with this system. Now, that may well be really useful for public health and for the taxpayers, but we need to think about it. And simply claiming, as, as has been done by the Minister and by ATA, uh, for some time that, look, don't worry, uh, you can trust us, it will be OK, I think is deeply disingenuous. Why hasn't they, this consultation taken place with ordinary people and with specialists in the past? Why, at this five minutes to 12, uh, do we now have uh, scope for opt-out? Why wasn't opt-out brought in right at the, right at the front? Uh, and a system that would respect consumers, people who have rights, people who have autonomy. Bruce, it, uh, it's also a matter of balance. The same paper that you're quoting from as idiot editorialised in recent days, though, in support of MHR. So yeah, there's, real, disagree there's real disagreement about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've had one of the email messages that's come through who says, I assume that the comments by the gentleman on privacy apply equally to all clinical records. Yes. So you're saying any clinical record, it's the system currently isn't... We, we have real concerns. We need, str we need stronger protection there. OK. Um, Going to a more uh, uh, focused uh, element, uh, if I could ask Charlotte, for the 14 to 17 year olds who can apparently take control of their records, what does one do about educating both them and their parents about this if it comes to this? Look, I think the 14 to 17 year old is, is, is the person that we need to be educating anyway. Um, from my perspective, G all GPs, we all know that at 14, if you're a, um, an intelligent, um, understanding young person, that you actually need to understand your rights as a health literate person. And that's all about privacy, being able to do things on your own without your parents, that you don't need to have parental consent for doing things as long as you do understand. Mm. And that's why yep. it's sort of like the intelligence. The, the, 
the, the time between 14 and 16, there are some who are very young and may not actually be able to make decisions that, uh, you know, don't require a parent. And there are others who absolutely can make decisions mm. and informed consent. So I very much see my role and I see GPs' roles is about that educating. It's about educating the parent who might not be ready to let go of overseeing and oversight of their mm. children's health mm. and educating the children to say, this is time you're now of an age where you actually have a right to sit in a room on your own without your parents yeah. and understand and have a discussion about your health care. Now that also then blows, you know, falls over into you have a, a health record that is electronic. You now can access that yourself and you can put permissions on it so that you can actually say, you know, I'm ready for mum and dad not to, to have access to my health record anymore. Or on the other hand, you go, I want mum and dad to still be accessing my health record because I want them to. They're, you know, we have that sort of relationship that I don't mind yeah. if they know that I've, you know, had been already been sexually active and I'm on the pill and I'm yeah. whatever, whereas mm. there might be another 14-year-old who there is no way that they want their mm. parents yeah. mm. to mm. know that. And so, again, it's about an individual discussion, but it's about informing them, it's yes. about informing the children and it's about informing the parents, the parents about saying yeah. that, OK, they're 14 now, you yes. actually need to be respectful mm. yeah. that you cannot just go and look at their health file without letting them know and actually letting them know that they can actually keep it private. So it's actually a really good opportunity because I think it's bringing into focus that this age group is an age group that we really need to be both upskilling and educating, empowering, being respectful for yes. in terms of mm. their rights and, and, and I think really being able to bring them up into the ability to be managing their health um, into the future as well. Kim seniors, can... seniors like me as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just young people. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. But I think that what happens, that grey area, particularly the 14 to 16 yeah. year olds, is that people don't appreciate that they actually have a right yeah. to healthcare without a parent in the room. Um, and it's sort of like, I'll often explain that, you know, when they're in the room, that whatever happens in the room is in the room and doesn't go anywhere else. Yep. And so again, that's, you know, that there might well be conversations that would never go onto a My Health record yep. and shouldn't go onto a health record versus actually that's something that's really important that we've now made this diagnosis or, you know, etc. Yep. should go on. What is shared, isn't shared, it all needs to be talked about. Mm. Kim, there... can I ask, are there aids available f for the sort of situation to protect younger people so, and older people uh, who want to ensure that their information isn't accessed by near and dear ones. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just following up um, from what um, Charlotte said. So from 14 years, um, young people can go onto our website and take control of their My Health record if, if they have one. That's um, a process that can be done or they can either um, call our helpline, either way that they can do that. And part of the, um, I guess, the communications that we're doing around the My Health record are not only for those 14 to 17 year olds, but also their parents, because we just want to give them um, some advice and support about how those conversations um, can happen. And there'll be other organisations like the National Children's Commissioner who will also give some um, advice and support. I think it's it's um, it's a part of growing up, like getting your licence, um, your own, potentially your own Medicare card, all of those things. Um, and a MyGov account, and uh, even when you start, start to, um, get a job that you, you need to register with the tax office. So part of that, that um, period of time where all of that online, um, that online world opens up for you as a young person. We also have a question uh, from James who asks, what sort of billing information is included on the MHR and how secure is this information? Um, so the the, um, the Medicare benefits scheme and the pharmaceutical benefits scheme uh, repositories are part of um, the My Health Records, so the information in there, um, which you can even um, get by logging into your Medicare account. So it's similar information, which is um, an item number, um, the provider who provided that um, that uh, service, and it's, it's only just a very small amount of information. It's not. Um, it, it's an administrative piece of information. It can give clues to a clinician about. Um, 
uh, about what um, has been done for that, but it's um, an administrative um, data set that already exists. But an item number can disclose mm. the service. So it does, item numbers yeah, are, and right. particularly with the MBS review, they're yeah. actually going to be more tightly identified yeah. with yep. the service so and you therefore... Can them out. So one of the things with your My Health record is you can actually say, I don't want any of that information on my My Health record. Can you say you want some of it but not other bits? So um, you can take an individual bit out or yeah. you have yeah. to take it all out? Well, it, I mean, yes, you, I was going to say, you can do the deleting, like you can delete a health yeah. record, right. you can delete bits. Okay. Um, so, you know, if, if you... It's like I sort of say to people, have it all there and then decide if you think that you don't want it, you can get rid of it and, or shut it down as you go. Um, if you delete information, does your GP made aware of it automatically? No. No. Right. So I, the only interaction that your GP has with the My Health Record is when I actively open it. Um, and there is no reason for me to actively open it unless I have you there with me and we're about updating it or getting something down. Because quite honestly, my record is a richer, fuller record. And I, again, I would only be opening a particular um, electronic file if I have reason to. For instance, if you ring me up and ask me a question or if... I'm sending off a referral or if I'm dealing with results that have come in or if I've actually got you there for a consultation. So, you know, in my health record, there is far less reason for me to open up and deal with it because, again, it's just a summary document um, and or a, a mechanism for me to be able to retrieve information that has not otherwise come to me. It's a summary at this stage and I would love to believe, sorry, I would love to believe that everyone out there in the world is as honourable and trustworthy as you but the reality tells us that they're not. You know, we've heard reference, reference to sort of, you know, uh, Medicare data. Remember, uh, roughly a year ago, uh, all, more than a million, million people's Medicare data uh, was leaked. A million people. Uh, this is a, what we're told is a state-of-the-art state of the art system. So constant claims that don't, don't worry, I mean, Minister Hunt's referred to military-grade security, which my IT uh, contacts just sort of fall on the floor laughing at this notion. Um, we're ignoring the human factor. Uh, we need to think seriously about risk, about autonomy and about respect. Thanks. Karen, can I ask you, what factors um, should patients who have a diagnosis of a stigmatising illness, mental health, um, HIV AIDS, what are the sorts of things they need to think of when it comes to my health record? Look, I think what they need to ask themselves is for each of these events um, that they're concerned about is how will my life be affected if that information gets out? If it gets out to women having terminations are particularly sensitive, if it gets out to a husband they haven't told or it related to a time when they were 16 but they don't want their husband to know now. People with mental illness, we know that there is bias. Um, certainly, I've spoken to some very well-educated people who are very concerned um, they're homosexual, very concerned that they might suffer bias. People need to look at their individual situation and say, what would have a negative impact on my life? And for me, I simply decide not to have that information there because I believe that we have to go forward on the basis that the information may get out. Yeah. And so it, it's just about... Um, individual. I think there's a very special case for genetic information. Um, genetic information is different because it gives a future risk that a disease might happen, but it doesn't tell you you've got that disease. But also, it affects your siblings, your offspring, your parents, your offspring's offspring. Yep. It's very important information that involves third parties. My big concern about genetic information is that if I decide to have a genetic test, having the results of that test actually affects my sister, yep. it affects my children, and it might affect their children. Yep. And therefore, it's a third-party consent process. And my understanding is that you can't get third-party consent. I can't consent no. to something on behalf of my sister. No. And so I think that storing this information where it may leak or become available is a very special circumstance yep. and I think it needs its own legislation. We do have um, non-discrimination against for genetic information under the Anti-Discrimination Act. However, I don't believe it's strong enough. Yep. 
In America, they have an act called GINA, which yes. is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It is solid, it is specific, it calls it out loud and, and wide, and I think I would urge the government to consider yes. having some very specific uh, legislation about that. Kim, what's the status of the genetic genomic information issue as far as MHR is concerned? Um, so, uh, pathology, um, so pathology reports can be uploaded to the My Health Record now. Um, and of course, you can ask that it's not uploaded um, to your GP or to your pathology provider, and they must um, they must go along with your with your wishes. And so, the, um, the, the I think some of the reports um, that are in the media at the moment is that is that genetic reports can um, be uploaded like any other report into the My Health Record, but um, your actual genetic makeup um, can't be uploaded to the My Health Record yet. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yet, the road to hell is paved paved with good intentions. Indeed, and what we will see is creep. Well, well, I think it's having that the conversations that we're having now though are really yeah. useful for that yeah. because it, it by putting up the sort of the red flag and going this is where we're happy to go to but no further is a really important yeah. conversation to have. Whereas it may well be that people go no, actually we do want further and these are the protections we're going to put in place. Um, and so I agree with yeah. you that we have to be aware of creep yeah. and what happens, but I also say that we need to have those conversations at we each need, step. We need, a, we need mm. a national discourse, and so academics such as myself have been calling this, mm. writing about this for at least five years. And the great, one of the great disappointments with, with the current health minister, his predecessor, and with ADHA is that this conversation has not been fostered. It's been a technocratic approach. OK, we're going to do it. Uh, and at the very last moment, when people start to get a sense of problems, it's, oh, all right, look, we'll, um, yeah, we'll let you opt out reluctantly, possibly we'll make it a bit difficult, and then people scream a bit more legitimately, and uh, don't worry, we're going to fix the legislation. This conversation should have been taking, taking place a couple of years ago, and it raises real questions about the legitimacy, the effectiveness of policy making and of administration. But we are having the conversation right here, right now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but with a, with, a fair, with a fairly restricted audience. Well, and, and you have to say... self-select. It's a yeah. bit late. It would have been nice to have had this conversation earlier. And yeah. I think that it is a disservice to consumers... Yes. ..when governments come out and say, we have this fabulous software, yes. it is never going to get out there. It's yeah. military grade. It's military All of those grade. things. Why don't we have a conversation that says, look, yeah. we know there's a risk. It's happened in the UK, it's happened in America, it happened in the yeah. Medicare records. Let's just assume that it's going to get out there. Let's minimise and mitigate the risk. Yeah. And that means having that legislation yeah. that protects people down the track. Some people have suggested that, say, women who live with chronic pain or have a, a history of anxiety should opt out as they risk their diagnos diagnosis being used as a reason to not investigate something further. How is the medical profession dealing with that sort of issue, where ang uh, anxiety on your record might mean the doctor would say, oh, well, you know, I won't go down that track? It's, okay, so you've built so that if a diagnosis is there, it's be a prejudice against yes. you. Yes. Look, you know, I mean, I think that's really difficult. As a doctor, I would like to say that that should never be um, the case, and it is all about, you know, from from my perspective, it is about full disclosure. I appreciate that I'm not the person sitting on the other side of the desk when I'm saying that. Um, but certainly, if you think that a doctor is not listening to you and is being disrespectful of your current health concerns because of another diagnosis on your record, then you need to go to another doctor because a good doctor will listen to you and take everything into account and make sure that what is actually needing to be investigated and managed appropriately does happen. So I suppose I would say it might be a red flag if you actually re reach that barrier rather than saying don't put it there. Um, use it as a, you know, a no. conduit. I mean, I look after a, a number of vulnerable populations. Um, so, for instance, transgender um, population, I have a number of patients, and I'm always astonished when they tell me the stories of terrible care because they have felt prejudiced against, etc. 
And, you know, I'm hopeful that we can educate doctors better as we go forward, and that's part of my role in being involved in teaching students. But, you know, there are people that I know we're never going to change. But, you know, quite honestly, it's about then making sure there are doctors there who are really good and mindful of all of that. And so we, you know, just go and find, and there's networks to be able to help you find the right person who's going to look after you, particularly for that condition if you feel you're not being listened to properly. Mm. Right. We, we know, Mark, that when women present in emergency departments, um, women are significantly less likely to get investigated for cardiac purposes rather than men. So we know that that basis, mm. that bias is just there and it's inherent. There is a chance that the e-health record will actually make it better because doctors will be aware that their action or non-action, non-investigation, is going to be recorded into a record. And therefore, I think that doctors will be more careful about making those assumptions. I, you know, myself, I've had five open heart surgeries and yet I still sometimes, in the emergency department, people say to me, do you suffer from anxiety attacks? <laughs> <laughs> and so I know that that actually is real and it's real at emergency times when people don't want it to be. So I understand why people are sensitive about having that in their record. But there is this chance that the e-health record might actually improve it rather than make it worse. <laughs> Look, we're now over time. Uh, I should just say, does anybody want to take literally a few seconds to make any final point in seconds rather than minutes? Look, my health record is a fantastic opportunity to actually really improve the way that, as a patient, we can navigate a very complex health system that we have in Australia. I'm extremely mindful that it is not the best yet, but it will, it's a, an evolving, evolving document and it is only by finding the gaps that we can get better. But let's hold the opportunity that we've got and use it and go forward and really make sure that the patient consumer is at the centre. So every improvement we've got has always got that at yeah. um, the heart of it. I have to say that everyone is going to make a choice and that the conversations that we're having here and elsewhere and in the future webinars are critically important. So, um, you know, to enable people to make the choice that, that this is right for them. From my point of view, it's a fabulous resource. It's a tool that we've wanted for a decade. There is ways of using it safely, and that is identifying your own personal risk and then stopping those records that you're worried about going into the record. Please don't abandon it altogether when you can actually be safe. If you're listening to this, this webinar, you're an adult, uh, use, your, use your agency, uh, use your dignity, hold your government to account, uh, require the government to come up with a system that does indeed produce all the benefits that we expect and that we deserve from a national e-health system. Well, I think we'll have to wrap it up there. Thank you for joining us and thank you very much to our panel of Charlotte, Kim, Karen and Bruce. I think you've heard a diversity of views here and I believe it, it is very helpful in our getting a better grasp of the issues involved. Thank you and good afternoon.